Recording. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Manic Community Health Centers for hosting today's sessions, Concussions with Dr. Richard Rapport. Dr. Rapport graduated summa cum laude from Lawrence University and then from the University of Michigan Medical School. He was a fellow at the National Institute of Health and worked for the US Public Health Service as a family doctor assigned to Glenville, Glenville, West Virginia for a year. He then completed his residency in neurological surgery at the University of Washington. Dr. Rapport was a visiting associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Malal in Kuala Lumpur on several occasions and was also a visiting pro professor at the University of Hawaii in Vietnam. He was a staff neurosurgeon at Group Health Cooperative in Seattle for nearly three decades. And shortly after, he joined the Faculty of Medicine at University of Washington School of Medicine and helped to manage the service at Harborview Medical Center until he retired in 2020. He now teaches at Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine at WSU and volunteers for the Maven Project. So Dr. Rapport, when you're ready, please begin. Okay, thank you very much, Kristen. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about concussions, prevention, treatment, and evaluation. I have a little bit of background uh, in this personally, because uh, as I was just telling Kristen, I played football for 12 years, a thing that I would not do anymore. In those days, if you got a ding, as the coach would call it, he'd come to the sidelines with you and show you some fingers and ask you how many he was holding up. And no matter how many he held up uh, and what you answered, you went back in the game. Things have changed a lot since that time because of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, which uh, I'm sure all of you know is becoming a kind of a major problem in the sports world. And we'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so we're gonna, uh, go through this outline, uh, beginning with what is a concussion? It's a mild traumatic brain injury that is caused by a blow to the head or a fall or other injury that jars or shakes the brain inside the skull. We all know that your brain is surrounded by CSF, which acts like a cushion to keep your brain from banging into your skull, skull but that doesn't always work. By definition, a concussion has no anatomical changes uh, and uh, there are no imaging uh, techniques that can diagnose a concussion. Uh, about 10% of people do not lose conscious, uh, uh, have a loss of consciousness. So there are clinical impairments associated with this to cognition, balance, attention span, headache, mood, vestibular function, oculomotor function, and sleep. All of these can be involved. <clears throat> uh, all of us are sophisticated enough to know that when you jar your head, it can move both back and forth in a rotatory fashion. <clears throat> and this uh, disrupts cognition and, and the rest of it. How big a problem is concussion? This is sort of an interesting slide actually. Uh, there are 1.4 million traumatic brain injury related deaths, hospitalization and emergency room visits in the United States each year. A lot of these are sports and recreational TBI related. In 2000, they were very costly, $12 billion in the United States, and they are underdiagnosed in the athletes who all want to stay in the game. Statistically, 52,000 deaths related, 275,000 hospitalizations, almost a million and a half ED visits. And then a lot of people uh, don't get care uh, because they don't think anything much happened to them. Causes are varied. Falls are enormous, MVAs, fights, blasts in war zones, sports are an enormous cause of TBI. Uh, the groups at the highest risks are shown below here. 
TBI by external causes, falls, half a million, hospitalization, 62,000, almost 10,000 deaths, deaths uh, being hit or in MVAs, assaults, other unknown, lots and lots of TBIs. This is kind of interesting. Uh, 16,000 are related to MVAs. What we used to call ding, again, when I was playing ball in high school and college and, and even in graduate school, um, a ding is a TBI, <clears throat> a thing that it took the NFL a while to recognize. <clears throat> this is how they break down uh, according to the sports involved. This is uh, sort of staggering. Bicycling leads the list. 26,000 TBIs a year from people falling off their bikes. Football's next, and then a long list of things, including this one, horseback riding. I guess a lot of people must fall off their horses because there's an awful lot of people that bang their heads doing that. <clears throat> um, there was a huge controversy about this in the NFL some years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, when the NFL sort of refused to address the problem. And uh, that got Congress involved. Um, there are ways to injure yourself without falling off a horse or a bike. And these include blasts in combat zones, or even blasts from uh, firecrackers. I once took care of a kid whose uh, friends thought it was funny uh, on the 4th of July to throw firecrackers, cherry bombs at him from behind and uh, hurt him badly. Uh, Peter Carelli, who uh, is retired now, was a general, uh, got interested in this uh, in our department. Actually, he came to talk to us at UW. Um, 63% of those wounded with TBIs had PTSD, according to Peter Carelli. So what are the symptoms that you might see? <clears throat> uh, the duration of uh, the problem is highly variable. It can last up to three or four months in my experience. Symptoms that last beyond three months are uh, by definition, the sort of post-concussion syndrome. Uh, but most people fully recover. Uh, they recover physically, cognitively, emotionally, and related to, as related to sleep. The physical findings are headache, blurry vision, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, sensitivity to light or noise. Balance problem is a huge one. Balance is often impaired in, with TBIs and concussion. No energy, numbness, tealing, tingling, being dazed or stunned. So lots and lots of things can show up in people who are uh, concussed. Foggy thinking is uh, part of the cognitive deficits, feeling slowed down, can't concentrate, not being able to remember new information, uh, confusion, and answering slowly. People complain of all of these things. And if you've taken care of folks with concussion, you will recognize a lot of this. People are uh, easy to anger, e easily upset, sad, nervous, anxious, over-emotional. They don't sleep well, <clears throat> sleep less than usual, and have a hard time falling asleep. And again, this can go on for three or four months. Children are in a particular category, as they are with almost everything. They cry a lot. They complain of headache. They don't play as they do uh, normally. They don't nurse or eat or sleep well. They're sad, don't have much interest in their usual toys, uh, and they aren't gaining new skills such as finding the toilet properly. Again, balance, uh, keep that in mind. Balance is a huge problem in this arena. Uh, this is, I'm showing you this because it's a trap. Um, and these days, almost anybody who has a TBI or a concussion is going to get imaged. And this is actually a patient I took care of. 
a 24 year old uh, man in the army got hit in the head with a blast and he complained of persistent imbalance and got this CT. The CT you will all recognize is very abnormal, but it has nothing to do with the TBI. You can see the cortical architecture pretty well. Uh, and what this is actually is congenital hydrocephalus. So the last thing you want to let your young enthusiastic resident do is shunt this guy because if you put a shunt in this pool of water under no pressure, it will collapse and he'll wind up with a blood clot on the surface of his brain. So sometimes people with pre-existing conditions get a blast injury or get a concussion or TBI. So just be careful about the meaning of the images. Post-concussion syndrome. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole list. You can read it yourself, but the same kinds of things, blurry vision, changes in sleep, changes in personality. And again, most importantly, dizziness, lightheadedness, unsteadiness. Poor balance is a cardinal finding. <clears throat> How is concussion diagnosed and evaluated? <clears throat> there are a bunch of forms and we'll look at those. Complete physical and neurological uh, learning and memory testing, and almost always these days, somebody is imaged. People with serious concussions should be carefully observed for a day or two in an ED. And if they have uh, observable worsening headaches, seizures, vocal signs, very drowsy, et cetera, uh, sometimes they need repeat evaluation and repeat imaging even. I don't have to remind this group too that in children particularly, CT scans are not benign. Uh, that's radiation and it's a lot of it for a little kid, so it's probably better to MR them. This was a 13-year-old boy playing football. He went back to play. He got a uh, decreased level of consciousness and he wound up uh, with this acute subdural in our hospital and underwent a bilateral hemicraniectomy. <clears throat> Second insult is a big problem because of disruption uh, in autoregulation, uh, particularly in teens. And here's another acute uh, clot in the kid who actually died. How is concussion treated? Rest is the best way, as much sleep as possible. Avoid this stuff, which you should avoid if you're a kid anyway. <clears throat> uh, Avoid demanding activities and allow yourself time to get better. Um, people who have concussions are very made very anxious by it uh, for good reason. They don't feel right. They can't do what they want to do. They can't do what they usually do. And they become anxious about it. And so they have to be reassured that concussions take time to get better, but they always get better. Yeah. Things that may complicate recovery, and this is a cardinal thing. We, we know now because of uh, a C, a CTE that a, acute concussion on top of a, a prior concussion is a very bad thing. Uh, people who get successive concussions do wind up with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and that is a situation which is progressive and doesn't get better. Um, <clears throat> migraine history makes it worse, developmental disabilities makes it worse, and the psychiatric history, like everything else, makes it worse. <clears throat> uh, all of this finding, particularly the, all of the work which has been done around CTE, and we can talk about that at the end if you want to, uh, has changed the uh, way the NFL is managing uh, head injuries. Um, we got to protect the competitors from themselves. And that is an understatement because guys like this have been playing football since they were five years old. That's what they know how to do. They're good at it. They're making money at it and they don't want to not play. So this is the epidemiology of TBI among high school athletes, <clears throat> boys football, 6% soccer, um, you can read the numbers for yourself. 
girls softball, I don't know, maybe they get hit in the head, but um, kids in school are competitive and they uh, play hard and they get hurt. Worldwide among children, Australian rules football, why anybody would play that in the first place is beyond me, but cricket, uh, skateboarding, I understand swimming, I maybe they run into the walls, tennis, golf, lots of things can lead to head injuries. Um, men's baseball uh, is, again, maybe they get hit in the head, uh, um, men's football leads the list. But this is kind of interesting too, women's ice hockey. I mean, women are just as competitive as men these days and they get hurt just as often. <clears throat> uh, women have actually an increased incidence cut of concussion versus men in the same sport with the same rules. And the reasons for this might reside here, nobody knows yet. Uh, this is where the controversy comes into uh, debate and it's getting more clear cut now, although somebody in the NFL just got fired for sending Tuva back to play too soon. Uh, there's, no, there's no real evidence for when it's safe to return to play. There's not, nothing on imaging. There's nothing really on an exam that will tell you absolutely that it's okay to go back. It's a lot different now than the coach sending you back no matter how many fingers he held up, but still judgment and experience like everything uh, guide return to play. Well, there are a couple of uh, concussion grading scales. Uh, this is the one that we use around here uh, and they're graded. Uh, they're pretty much the same. Mostly it has to do with confusion, uh, loss of consciousness, symptoms lasting for more than 15 minutes, and of course, coma. Uh, kids should, athletes should not return to play until they're symptom free. And that means they have to rest. Uh, they have to uh, get back to their exercise routine slowly. They have to start running slowly, uh, non-contact, uh, then full controlled training, and finally return to play. Uh, uh, the high school principles for return to pay, play are a little more stringent. And when in doubt, sit them out is good advice. Uh, in college and pros, one concussion and you're out. In the army, same kind of deal. Three or more concussions, you have to sit out for the season and maybe permanently. Blood in the head, any blood in the head. And by the way, I'll just insert here parenthetically, this will never happen, but I think if you CT'd all the members of an NFL football team after a game, there'd be a lot of blood in the head that was unseen. Small amounts of shears, tears, little drop of blood here and there. If you have blood in the head, you got to sit out for a year and then repeat MR and RCT plus neuropsych testing. The NFL has these disqualifying factors. You can read them. Uh, there is a sports concussion as, uh, assessment tool, um, and this is the link to it, which you can get if you want to. <clears throat> there is uh, a pamphlet or a paper about it, it used by medical professionals, four pages long, takes 20 minutes to administer this SCAT-1 test. Uh, athletes above 10 are eligible to take it. As I've mentioned a couple times, balance is the first thing to go. And so uh, you can ask people to do these things and finally, and to stand on one leg, tandem dance, which I won't show you. Um, but 
Uh, these are easy to administer, just standing on one leg. People have a very hard time doing that after a significant concussion. So that's a simple thing that can be done even at the sidelines to decide uh, whether people can go back in the game. There are graduated scales for return to play. No activity, uh, light, sports specific, non-contact, and then full practice and return to play. And these have to be taken seriously. Again, in the era of our understanding about CTE, getting banged again after a first concussion is really bad for you. So how are concussions prevented? These things are self-explanatory. You have to wear the proper uh, kind of gear. Uh, you shouldn't you know, uh, take drugs or uh, drink before a football game. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, you have to uh, be careful about doing these sorts of activities. It's very easy to get hurt skateboarding, skiing, or riding a horse, as I've shown you already. In older people, uh, it's best to make the home safer and prevent falls, uh, particularly these days when everybody my age is taking aspirin. Uh, when I was attending in the uh, uh, Harborview Medical Center uh, Neuro ICU, which was a 45 bed unit, at any one time about 20% of those patients had uh, acute subdurals uh, because they were taking aspirin when they fell down. Uh, there's a public education site, which again, you can get if you want to. Now in Washington state, there was great advocacy about this, uh, well, maybe a dozen years ago, 15 years ago, because of a kid named Zach Lystead. Uh, Zach was playing football and um, he got hit and he came out and then he went back in and he got hit again and he was very badly injured. So all students have to sign an information sheet regarding concussion in Washington state now prior to each season. The school district works with uh, the athletes and the athletic association to make sure everybody understands this stuff. <clears throat> um, this was passed into law in Washington state many years ago. They have to have written clearance to return to practice and play by somebody who knows what they're talking about uh, before they can go back. This was passed in 2009. Here's the then governor signing the Zach uh, Leistead bill. And this guy in a wheelchair is Zach. Uh, I think this is now the law in every state. Uh, when I made this slide, it wasn't, but I'm pretty sure now it is in every state. <clears throat> it's certainly supported by the NFL in every state. So, this is important to, particularly to younger people who are most at risk. Uh, this is what happens to them as a consequence of uh, a concussion, particularly repeat concussions is gonna be important to them for the rest of their lives. So, in conclusion, uh, the thing we most want not to do is return somebody to play who uh, ought not to be returned to play. And again, that's mostly experience and being careful. Okay, uh, that is... All I have to tell you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rapport. That was great. If anybody has any questions, please use the uh, Q&A box or the chat box for the raise hand feature to speak directly with Dr. Rapport. Um, I don't see any right now, so I'll just keep rambling. 
Remember that when you close out of this Zoom webinar, um, a C, your uh, CME survey is going to appear on your browser. You want to uh, complete that survey to receive CME credit. If you miss it or you don't have time, it'll come tomorrow in the email from Zoom. It's also the same link to every survey for every CME session. So you can always uh, save that in your files. All right, still waiting for some questions. So uh, while we're waiting, I'm going to quickly, I'm gonna share my screen. And just remind everyone that if you think of a question afterwards, you can always go to our Maven project, um, our VC platform. So if that's by going to our homepage, if you click on the clinic portal, that will bring you to this page where you can go to medical consults and log into your VC platform. And that's where you could ask Dr. Rapport your questions that you forgot for this session or just came to you afterwards. Um, you can also see all of our upcoming sessions under um, educational sessions up here. You can click here and you'll see what's coming next in the coming, in the coming weeks, all of them. Uh, it's up through the end of the year. And let's say you miss it or you, you really enjoyed this session today on concussions in two weeks, it'll be on our on-demand uh, library as well all of our, our sessions. And last but not least, if you'd like a mentor, and we don't just do mentor for new, pro, uh, new providers, excuse me, that's anybody, uh, wherever you kind of feel a gap in your career, you can always sign up for a, a mentor. We also do specialized mentoring. So um, we just finished, somebody just finished EKG mentoring. So if you wanted to do mentoring on just concussions alone, you could also request a mentor for that. So I think I've rambled enough. Um, I still don't see any questions. So I'm going to assume that it was a great presentation and everybody is questionless and they're now experts. So thank you, Dr. Rapport for joining us today and uh, presenting, it was really wonderful. My pleasure, thank you for helping me, Kristen. Of and course. Shirley. Have All a great right. day, everybody. Thank you.